Hello, BISC 130. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 4-3, uh, continuing on with the chapter on regulating gene expression. We began this in the last recorded lecture just to introduce some terminology like transcription factors, activators, repressors, uh, but now I'm going to get uh, deep into a specific example that will hopefully make those concepts make a little bit more sense. So uh, this extended example, which is going to take most of this recorded lecture to be honest, is talking about something called the LAC operon. So there are two parts to this. What the heck does LAC stand for and what is an operon? Um, let's go after operon first. Uh, the LAC operon is an operon. <laughs> so, okay, so what is an operon? Uh, well, the key terms defined an operon as a collection of related genes that are transcribed together as a single mRNA. We should visualize this. So in the last chapter, when we were looking at transcription and translation, you know, we have the promoter and the transcription start site, and then we have a terminator that tells transcription, you know, where to end. And we transcribe an mRNA, and then that mRNA gets translated into protein with a start codon and a stop codon. In an operon, there are multiple genes, in this case three, but it's not always three, in an operon, there are multiple genes that are transcribed together, back to back, as part of one big long messenger RNA. So you have a single transcription start site, a single promoter, a single terminator here, and you end up with this massive messenger RNA that contains several genes. Each one has their own start codon, stop codon, start codon, stop codon, start codon, stop codon. Um, this is just a way of organizing things. Uh, it's useful if you have multiple genes that are all related to one another, if they're doing kind of the same job, if they're involved in the same metabolic pathway or process. So yeah, this is a convenient way to, to lump things together like this. Importantly, this is prokaryote only. We do not have operons. Eukaryotes, we do not organize our genes like this. We have you know, one gene, one mRNA, one protein. It's only prokaryotes that will lump them together like this. So this example we're going through is gonna be a, a prokaryote example. So that explains the operon part of this title here. What about LAC? Well, the LAC stands for lactose. So this operon contains three genes that encode proteins, that are involved in breaking down lactose. You may remember lactose from many chapters ago. It is a disaccharide. In order to do anything with this, um, we have to break apart this glycosidic bond uh, and create monosaccharides. And you know, obviously we break down lactose as, as humans uh, from milk, unless you're lactose intolerant and these pills will help you. Uh, but again, we have these genes, we just don't organize them in an operon. This operon we're talking about is prokaryote only. So the reason I'm bringing up this operon is because it's controlled. We're talking about transcription factors here and this is kind of a two for one because there are two transcription factors involved in controlling the LAC operon. So let's start with the, the, the simpler one. And let's look at the logic here, because there, there is a mechanism, there's a protein, there's a thing that's physically going on, but there's also a logic behind why this is the way it is. Bacteria really want to be as efficient as possible. They don't want to waste any energy. They're living in highly competitive environments surrounded by other bacteria and fungi and microorganisms, whatever. They don't want to waste energy. So it takes a lot of energy to express a gene or an operon. Transcription takes a lot of energy and raw materials and translating this mRNA into protein, uh, that also takes a lot of energy, a lot of raw materials, amino acids, a lot of ATP. It costs a lot of energy to go from gene to mRNA to protein. These bacteria don't wanna waste energy. So they only want to express the LAC operon, again, gene expression means uh, you know, gene to mRNA to protein to do and stuff. They only want to express this LAC operon if lactose is actually 
around them if lactose is actually available. Um, this Logically, this should make a lot of sense. And my, my dumb analogy here is if you were a potato farmer and you were surrounded by potatoes and you had fields and fields of potatoes, would you go to the store and buy a fancy expensive wheat processing machine? No, that would be a massive waste of money. Don't buy this if you don't have any wheat to process. So yeah, don't do this Operon unless there's actually lactose around for you to deal with. That's the logic here. It's wasteful to make useless proteins. Now, how is this accomplished? Well, this is accomplished through, again, I, I numbered this one because like I said, there are gonna be two transcription factors controlling this process. This uh, logic gate uh, is controlled by a transcription factor called the LAC repressor protein, sometimes just called LAC repressor, but LAC repressor protein is going to be used to make this happen. Oh, side note, I'm not going to be a stickler for this on my exam questions, but in case you're curious, um, you're supposed to put genes in italics. That's why every time I say LAC operon, I have the little italics there. Uh, it's not italics here because I'm not talking about a gene. In this phrase, I'm talking about a protein. So anyway, I'm not a stickler for that. If you're wondering why these things are italics, uh, by convention, biologists put gene names in italics. Okay, so what is this lac repressor protein? So the lac repressor protein can do one of two things, depending on whether there's lactose around or not. Let's start with the if lactose is absent. So if there is no lactose around, this lac repressor protein will bind to something called the operator. So operators in the key terms, but let me show this. So here's our slide from before. Uh, there's you know our operon. Here's the transcription start site right there, the plus one. And here's the operator. So we can see that it's before the genes actually start in the DNA, but it's after you know it's right after the transcription start site, right after where RNA polymerase would bind. So how do the key terms define this? The key terms say an operator is a region of DNA outside of the promoter region that is bound by activators or repressors. So this part of the DNA exists only for transcription factors to bind to. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit on this region. There we go, there's promoter, there's RNA polymerase. These are our three important genes in the operon. There's the operator. And here is the repressor protein. Like I said, Repressor protein binds to this operator. So what is this gonna do? Well, this is gonna shut the whole thing down. Remember what RNA polymerase is supposed to do when it binds to the promoter. It's supposed to create a transcription bubble, it's unzip the DNA locally and sort of move along. If there is a big old protein stuck in the way, uh, this is a this is a roadblock. This is uh, this is something that's going to prevent RNA polymerase from actually moving its little transcription bubble onto these genes. That's going to shut down transcription. So, lac repressor binds to the operator. This is sequence specific. So again, there there is a sequence here that we are obviously not memorizing, but this repressor protein does not just bind randomly to the chromosome. It's got some specific G, G, A, T, C, C, A, G, whatever sequence that it specifically recognizes and binds to. So it represses just this thing, not random genes across the chromosome. So the repressor protein binds to the operator, sequence specific. And yeah, this one's straightforward. It physically blocks RNA polymerase from transcribing. Expression of the LAC operon is going to be repressed or off. So for this scenario, you should understand the mechanism. It's off because repressor gets in the way. You should also understand the logic. It is off because there's not any lactose around. Don't don't make weight and don't make useless proteins. It should be off if lactose is absent. What about the other scenario? What if there is lactose around? Well, if lactose is present, lactose, the, like the actual sugar itself, binds to the lac repressor protein. And you know we, we've seen this before, and I think we'll see this again, when you bind things to proteins, when you attach 
uh, I guess we saw phosphorylation in an earlier chapter. We saw activators and repressors in earlier chapters. Anytime you add something to a protein, that's going to change its shape. So when lactose binds to the lac repressor protein, it causes a shape change. And as it turns out, this lac repressor protein with lactose attached to it is no longer able to bind to DNA. Here's our visual on this. Uh, there's promoter, operator, genes, and yeah, here's the repressor not repressing. It has lactose attached to it. It's not bound to the operator. It can't bind to DNA in this scenario, so there is no repression happening. Uh, so RNA Paul can now transcribe the lac operon freely. Lac operon is going to be on, but it's going to be low. So. I'll explain this in just a second, but it is, it is going to be slightly on, and logically that should make sense. Yep, there's lactose around. You should be going for it. It's worth it to spend all the energy to do transcription and translation because there's actually lactose around. So why is it low? Uh, and what do I mean by low? Well, we talked about promoters in an earlier chapter and how this is a very specific sequence that this RNA polymerase is supposed to bind to so it knows where it is supposed to start. As it turns out, not all promoters are equal. Not all promoters have exactly the correct ideal sequence. Some promoters for some genes or operons are what we call weak promoters. Their sequence is just not quite right. Uh, and so what that means is RNA polymerase is going to bind to these kind of weak promoters and, you know, maybe start transcription, but it's going to be so uncertain as to whether this is a real promoter or not, that more often than not, the RNA polymerase is just going to detach and not actually do anything in the first place. So the promoter for this lac operon is one of those weak promoters. Its exact sequence here is just not quite right. So even if there's no roadblock at all, you're still only going to have low expression levels because the promoter is just not recognized by RNA polymerase that well. So yeah, in this scenario, we have low expression levels because the promoter is quote unquote weak, which means it's not easily bound by RNA polymerase. So how do, we, how do we actually get strong expression? How do we get lots and lots of expression? Well, to understand that, we have to look at our second transcription factor. Again, all of this was the action of the lac repressor protein, either repressing and getting in the way in the absence of lactose, or not repressing, not getting in the way in the presence of lactose. So what's the other one? All right. Again, let's do the logic first, then the mechanism. There are a ton of sugars out there, and lactose is kind of a pain in the butt to deal with. It kind of takes you know, a bunch of extra genes and processing steps to make this usable form. If you're trying to be as efficient as possible, you don't want to touch this stuff if there's a better sugar around. So our second mechanism takes this logic into account. These bacterial cells only want to express the lac operon if a better sugar source is not available. It takes some energy to deal with lactose. It is more efficient to use glucose if it is available. Glucose you know, goes straight into the cellular respiration pathway. It's the simplest, easiest sugar to deal with. And yeah, if you've got both of these available, the cells will not even want to deal with lactose. They would rather use glucose instead. I've got another analogy for you. Let's pretend that you are trying to be as lazy as possible. You're trying to be as efficient with your energy as possible on uh, you know, a, a slow Sunday afternoon. Uh, but you're hungry, you need some food, and so you get up and go to the kitchen, and uh, in this scenario, you're kind of a weirdo, because in this scenario, there are only two items sitting there in your fridge. There is a carton of blueberries, and there is an entire pineapple. Now, if you are trying to be as lazy as possible, as efficient with your energy as possible, the pineapple is delicious, but man, you got to cut off the top and trim off the sides and cut the, you know, the fruit away from the core, and then... You 
then you should wash your knife, wash your cutting board, you know, put all that stuff away. Then you can eat your pineapple. It's nutritious and delicious and good, but it takes a lot of energy to deal with. The blueberries, you just eat those. Uh, there's not even any stems or seeds or cutting involved at all. You just eat them. Hopefully they're already washed and you don't even have to do that. You can just eat these. So in this scenario, you would always go after the e easier food source if it's, if it's available. Uh, if there were no blueberries and the only food was pineapple, sure, yeah, don't starve to death. Eat your pineapple. But you always want to go for the easy one first. Same here. These cells always want to go after glucose first only lactose if they've run out of glucose. So in order to achieve this logic, in order to achieve this, uh, the cells are going to use a transcription factor called catabolite activator protein, abbreviated CAP or CAP. This one is not a repressor like the last protein was. This is, as the name implies, this is an activator, the, the exact opposite. Before we talk about how CAP works, we have to talk about something called cyclic AMP. Now, cyclic AMP is something I brought up in an earlier chapter, if this slide looks slightly familiar. This was an example of something that I called a second messenger several chapters ago. So why is this coming up now? Well, this whole logic here for our second mechanism has to do with glucose. But we are not going to directly involve glucose. Instead, these mechanisms are going to involve cyclic AMP. So oh, how does cyclic AMP relate to glucose? Well, like this. If there are high levels of glucose in the cell, that means there will be low levels of cyclic AMP. You could say CAMP, you could, pay, you could say CAMP, you could say cyclic AMP, all of those refer to the same, the same molecule. High glucose means low cyclic AMP. This is a small signaling molecule. And conversely, if there are low levels of glucose, there are going to be high levels of cyclic AMP. So glucose and cyclic AMP are inversely related. And it's very important to remember the relationship between these because we're actually going to, we're not going to directly involve glucose, we're going to involve cyclic AMP in this regulation process. So we've got our catabolite activator protein and, and here's where it devolves into alphabet soup and try to follow me with this. CAP needs CAMP to activate. This catabolite activator protein, it's an activator, it turns up transcription levels, it cannot function on its own it needs this small signaling molecule in order to activate. In other words, it needs low glucose to activate because low glucose is the only scenario where you would have lots of cyclic AMP. Side note, these are easy to mix up, CAP and CAMP. My dumb way of remembering which one is which is CAP is a big protein. Proteins are very large compared to, you know, things like this. Uh, CAP is all capital letters. It's all big letters. The C is a big letter. This is a big protein. In contrast, CAMP is a lowercase c. It's a little c there at the beginning. Uh, that helps me remember that CAMP is the small signaling molecule, whereas CAP is the big protein. Anyway, just a side note, but don't get which, them confused which one is which. Protein, small signaling molecule. So, okay, how does this actually work? Well, just like we had for the last control mechanism, there are gonna be two scenarios, if glucose is around and if glucose is not around. So if glucose is not around, that means we can go back to this, low glucose levels or no glucose levels means high levels of cyclic AMP. That means CAP, is gonna have its partner. And yeah, here we go, the, the CAP-CAMP complex, uh, the uh, activator protein with its little partner. And what this activator protein does is it binds close to the promoter uh, and it binds to RNA polymerase. Remember, RNA polymerase does not have a very strong hold on this promoter. This is a weak promoter because of its sequence. 
But with this activator bound right next to it, oops, sorry, skipped to the wrong one. With this activator bound right next to it, that is going to stabilize RNA polymerase at the promoter and help it get started. And yeah, it'll create its little transcription bubble, move past the operator, start transcribing these genes. Remember, this is an activator. It's supposed to help things work, which is exactly what we're seeing here. So in summary, if glucose is low or absent, there's going to be plenty of CAMP. CAP binds CAMP, then it binds close to the promoter, once again, in a sequence-specific fashion. We don't want this binding willy-nilly all over the chromosome, random sequences. It's specific for some sequence here near the promoter. The CAP-CAMP complex uh, stabilizes RNA polymerase and helps start transcription. Expression is going to be on, and it's going to be strong. You should understand the mechanism for why the expression is going to be activated and turned on, and you should understand the logic for, for this. This was if glucose is low or absent. This was the if you have run out of easy food, yes, you should go ahead and start doing the you know pain in the butt more difficult food because you don't want to starve to death. So yes, you should understand the mechanism. You should understand the logic. What about the other scenario? if glucose is around, if glucose levels are high, or if glucose is present you know, around the cell. Well, high levels of glucose mean, if I can return to this slide, low levels of cyclic AMP. Low levels of cyclic AMP means CAP does not have its partner, and so it's not going to do any of the stuff that I just showed. Without cyclic AMP, CAP can't bind to near the promoter and then bind to RNA polymerase. So without that, there's just no activation happening here. Uh, this is a weak promoter. So without any activation, you're just going to get low or weak expression levels. In summary, if glucose is high or present, CAP has no CAMP. CAMP levels are going to be low. Uh, CAP cannot bind to DNA without its cyclic AMP partner. That means there's going to be no stabilization of RNA polymerase. Expression is on, uh, but again, because this is a weak promoter and there's no activator helping out, expression levels are going to be low. Now, the fun part of this. Both of these transcription factor mechanisms are working together. The presence or absence of lactose and the presence or absence of glucose are both at work in determining whether this operon is transcribed or not. Let's walk through this because there are four possible scenarios here with regards to lactose and glucose, four possible combinations. So let's start out with, and this is no new information. You know, I got all, all four of these scenarios here. This is nothing new. Uh, this is everything we've already talked about. This is just kind of recapping or summarizing what these look like together. So let's look at this one. Low glucose, lactose available. So lactose available means the repressor is not going to be repressing. Lactose is going to be bound to that repressor. The repressor protein is going to be floating off somewhere, not bound to the operator. That's what happens when lactose is around. So no repressor here. Low glucose means high cyclic AMP. And look at that. CAP has its cyclic AMP partner. It's bound near the promoter. It's stabilizing RNA polymerase genes are going to be strongly expressed. There is no repressor and there is an activator doing its thing. Genes are going to strongly be on. That's the mechanism. Double check with the logic. We've run out of easy sugar. We have lactose available. Of course we want to make these genes so we could metabolize lactose. Let's look at the next one. High levels of glucose, lactose unavailable. Well, Lactose unavailable means the repressor protein is going to be doing its thing. It's going to be roadblocking. It's going to get, it be bound to the operator. It's going to get in the way. High glucose means low cyclic AMP, which means the activator protein is not able to do its thing. So not only is there no activation, but there is a repressor in the way. These genes are definitely not going to be expressed. And again, this makes sense. There's no lactose around. There is glucose. Just use glucose. You don't want to be expressing this. Now, we have low glucose and lactose unavailable. No lactose means the repressor is repressing. 
low glucose means high cyclic AMP, which means CAP will have its partner. It will be activating. It will be helping get things started. But it doesn't matter how good of a job CAP does at stabilizing RNA polymerase and helping it begin transcription. If there is a repressor in the way, you're not going to get transcription. It's going to stop the whole thing. So in this scenario, yeah, Operon is off. And again, this makes sense. There's no lactose around. Don't make genes for metabolizing lactose. Finally, we have high glucose, lactose available. So lactose available means there's going to be no repressor here. It's not bound to the operator. It's going to be floating off somewhere with lactose bound to it. High glucose means low cyclic AMP, which means CAP is not going to have its partner it's not going to be bound to the, the binding site next to the promoter. It's not going to be stabilizing RNA polymerase. So even though there is no roadblock here, there's also no activator. So expression levels, they'll be on, but because this is a weak promoter and there's no activator helping things out, there's going to be very low levels of this the genes in this operon being expressed. Um, so uh, I'm not going to be, you know, writing down any of these. You, you could try to memorize what happens in all four of these scenarios, but honestly, if you understand how CAP functions, when it activates, when it doesn't activate, how LAC repressor protein functions, when it represses, when it doesn't repress, you could, you know, logic through and, and figure out what would happen in any of these four combinations of scenarios. So yeah, I really like this figure as a good summary of things, but I'm not going to write down all this. We, we've already kind of talked about what happens in all these scenarios. This is just putting all of them together. The one last thing I do want to note is the only, you know, as, as, we, as we saw here, the only scenario in which this lac, lac operon is expressed strongly is if lactose is present and there are low levels of glucose. And again, this should make sense mechanistically, and this should make sense logically. There's lactose around, there's not a better sugar, green light, game on. Okay, now there are, there are a bunch of other sections in this chapter, all of which I'm sort of cutting for time and, uh, and or for complexity. Uh, so yeah, this, this takes us to the end of the regulating gene expression chapter, but not to the end of this recorded lecture, I do briefly want to begin the next couple of chapters. The next two chapters, chapter 18 and 19, both deal with evolution. Evolution in the origin of species and the evolution of populations. Just like I did for the two genetics chapters, I just don't, I, I, I like the textbook and I like what it has, I just don't necessarily like the way things are organized. So I'm sorry if you're following along with the textbook, but I'm going to mush these two together and just call this topic evolution, covering topics from both chapter 18 uh, and chapter 19. So, okay, before we get into evolution at all, there are a few terms that I really want to outline. These are the terms hypothesis, theory, and law. So let's start with hypothesis. Hypothesis is defined in the key terms as a suggested explanation for an observation which one can test. So you see something going on in the world, you know, whether it's biology or astronomy or chemistry or physics or, you know, whatever, you see something happening in the natural world and you come up with a, a, a guess, uh, maybe an educated guess, maybe a reasonable guess, maybe a logical guess, but you, you come up with something like, oh, maybe this is happening for this reason. This is the ground floor. This is how we understand the world around us. We formulate a hypothesis, and yeah, maybe there's very little evidence to support it. Maybe there's no evidence to support it, but this is the reason why we make careful observations and we do experiments in the first place to test this hypothesis and see whether our experiments or observations will support this observation or this, uh, this explanation or whether they don't support this explanation. This is sort of the, the ground floor close to the ground floor of things. 
if you're taking the BISC-131 lab, I know as part of that lab, you'll formulate a lot of hypotheses and test a lot of hypotheses. So uh, this might be familiar to you if you are taking or have taken that lab already. The other term that I want to bring up is theory or scientific theory. Scientific theory is defined in the key terms as a tested and confirmed explanation for observations or phenomena. Theories or scientific theories are based on reproducible experiments and reproducible observations. So you may start with a hypothesis, you may do a bunch of careful experiments, observations, you see the same things every time, different research groups see the same things over and over and over again. Once there has been a lot of support for whatever this explanation is, we can start calling this a theory. This is, this is very weird because in our everyday English language, the word theory is not a very strong word. Uh, in our everyday English language, the word theory is, is, is usually means a guess. Like, yeah, my car's making a clunking sound. Yeah, I got a theory about what's doing that. Like in, in the English language, uh, theory is like a hypothesis. It's a guess, it's where we start. But what I want to impress upon you is whether it's biology or chemistry or physics or whatever, in a scientific field, when something is called a theory, that is not a guess, that is not a like baseline explanation. If we call something a theory, there's a ton of support for it. Let me give you an example of something that's kind of a no-duh uh, these days. And that's something called germ theory. A germ theory states many diseases are caused by microorganisms. And again, this is a no duh. We've got bacteria, we've got viruses, we have these, these microbes uh, that are responsible for causing infectious diseases. Don't memorize this table, but yeah, I, I think most people know bacteria can cause disease. And there is a ton of support for this, for all, for all of these things uh, causing various diseases. This is germ theory. Uh, not because it's a guess, there's an overwhelming amount of support for you know, diseases being caused by bacteria and other microorganisms. The reason why it is a theory is because of its scope. So not only are theories based on reproducible experimentation and or observation, uh, theories are always things that are broad in scope. They explain the how and the why. How, uh, you know, anthrax produces toxins that, you know, trigger the immune response, whatever, and why it does that, and you know, things like that. Theories are always broad in how they explain things. Now we can contrast this with our third term here. So we had a hypothesis, theory or scientific theory, and law or scientific law. A law is, to read from the key terms, a tested and confirmed explanation for observations or phenomena. Wait a second, that, that sounds familiar. A tested, so scientific law was a tested and confirmed explanation for observations or phenomena. Uh, theory was a tested and confirmed explanation for observations or phenomena. Oh, those definitions are the same. <laughs> so uh, theories and laws hold the same amount of weight. And I even wrote the same thing here. Just like a scientific theory, a scientific law is based on reproducible experimentation and or observation. You only start calling some explanation a law after there is a lot of support for it. Once again, this is at odds with just our English language. In the English language, the word law is very strong. You follow the law, you can't break the law, they're, they're, they're written down in stone or whatever. Uh, and so yeah, law sounds very strong, theory sounds very weak, like a guess or whatever. But in the field of physics, chemistry, biology, in science, theory is very strong law is very strong the only difference between the two is not one of strength or support it is one of scope theories as we saw were very broad in scope 
laws are very narrow in scope often just explaining the you know what's going on not talking about why or how just what is observed there's a great example of this we've already talked about laws earlier in the quarter maybe you remember the first law of thermodynamics energy cannot be created or destroyed that doesn't explain how energy you know behaves or why it can't be destroyed all this law is saying is that you can't destroy energy or create energy just the, the what of you know energy behaving the rules of energy and the reason why this is a law of thermodynamics and not a theory of thermodynamics is because it's very narrow in scope in the same way the reason why this is germ theory and not germ law is because this explanation about diseases and microorganisms is very broad in scope it's not narrow in scope this will never be germ law uh, it will always be germ theory uh, because of because of its scope and what it's trying to explain so a very important point here and again, I'm making, a, I'm making a big point of this because this is, this is unintuitive for how our English language works. A law is not a better supported theory. They hold equal weight to one another, theories and laws, whether some well-supported observation of the natural world counts as a, you know, is classified as a theory or a law, is simply one of scope. Okay. Now that we've outlined these terms, we can talk about the theory of evolution. So evolution is going to be a theory. There's going to be a lot of support for it, and this is going to be a very broad scoped explanation. But actually, before we get to the theory of evolution, I actually just want to define what evolution is. So this is not in the key terms because I've, I wanted to write out this definition and sort of unpack this because there are three important parts to this simple definition that I want to talk about in more detail. We can define evolution as change in the genetic makeup of a population over time. And hopefully I drill this short little sentence into your head because I'm going to use this phrase, change in the genetic makeup of a population over time, many, many times over the next couple of uh, recorded lectures. So one part of this that I want to explore is population. Evolution is change in a population. That means evolution occurs not at the individual level, but at the population level. So I defined population, I think on the first day of class, I think in the first chapter, but you know, it's been a while, so it's, it's in the key terms for this chapter as well. Population is defined as all of the individuals of a single species living within a specific area. So these changes that we are going to observe are not going to be one little critter changing. The changes that we're going to see are changes within a group of critters. Uh, I like Pokemon as much as the next person, but yeah, the idea that one individual is going to morph into a different kind of thing is not what we observe in nature. Uh, individuals do not evolve. It's changes in the group level. Again, this is kind of an odd with our with like everyday English. You know, we'll talk about evolution. Oh yeah, my taste in music has evolved a lot since middle school, or you know, something like that. Um, individuals do not evolve. Uh, we're talking about changes within a group. Another important part to this phrase, change in the genetic makeup of a population over time, is genetic makeup. And yeah, recently we had a bunch of chapters talking about genes and genetic makeup. So when I say genetic makeup, I mean allele frequency. We're talking about which alleles are within the population. So allele frequency itself is defined in the key terms. Let me read that. The rate at which a specific allele appears within a population. So the changes that we are seeing are changes in genotype, you know, which alleles are common, which alleles are not common. And again, this has to be on the population level. Uh, your alleles are not going to change over your lifetime. Uh, but, you know, within a big group of people, you could have, you know, individuals being born, individuals dying, you know, that can change in a big group. It's not going to change within an individual. So we're talking about changes in simply the frequency of alleles which alleles are common which are less common the third part of this definition is the term over time 
So when I say over time, I don't mean, you know, in the next five minutes or whatever. Uh, I don't even necessarily mean in the next year. When we say the phrase over time, what we're talking about is generations. So in order for us to observe these sorts of changes, we have to see individuals in the population being born or created and dying. We have to see that kind of turnover. And yeah, it's gonna take generations for that turnover to happen. So exactly how long this takes depends on what population you're looking at. Bacteria, you know, that can reproduce in 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, yeah, you're gonna be able to see meaningful changes in allele frequency in those bacterial populations overnight. But if you're talking about organisms that have generation times of years, it's going to take much longer to observe changes in the genetic makeup of these populations. So yeah, over time, we mean generations. That's what it's going to take to be able to observe these changes. So this is our definition of what evolution is, change in the genetic makeup of a population over time. But how and why? How do these changes happen? Why do these changes happen? If the theory of evolution is a theory, it should explain these things and there should be a ton of support for it. We, this will happen. <laughs> we will talk about how these changes happen, why these changes happen, and the you know, overwhelming support we have for this. We will do that starting in the next recorded lecture. So yeah, I just briefly wanted to start on, on evolution here to define these terms, get us ready. We will really get into this chapter or I suppose these chapters in the next one, but this is the end of recorded lecture for three.